I know we've got a number of others uh, uh, joining us either at broadcast sites or uh, individually on their own computers, um, wherever they may be. So I want to welcome you all here. Uh, the topic of today's um, talk is EAB and Minnesota's ash resource. We're going to hear first from Marcella Winmuller Campioni, then from Mark Abrahamson with the Minnesota Department of Ag and Colleen Matula with the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, hope we can keep all the balls in the air and, and make everything flow smoothly here. Um, before I hand the floor to Marcella, I will just uh, remind folks this is um, one of 12 webinars offered this year, presentations offered this year through SFEC and the Sustainable, excuse me, the uh, University of Minnesota Extension Forestry team. Uh, next month we'll hear from Jim Boyer. Jim is um, well known in our forestry community. He'll be talking about life cycle analysis uh, and I think give us some good information as we hear about substituting, you know, different products for wood. How does that impact environmental issues and uh, energy usage and a whole variety of things? I think it's a good, a good topic for us all to be thinking about as we consider uh, forest management, some of the trade-offs and uh, environmental concerns that we sometimes hear about associated with that. Uh, so uh, any information on that you can find on the SFEC website, um, and I hope you'll be able to join us next month. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand the floor to Marcella Winmuller Campioni. Marcella is the silviculturist at the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and uh, Marcella, you are on. At least I think so. Yep, you're good. Now, uh, okay, back to back to full screen. Okay, let's see. Okay, awesome. So, just in case you're uh, joining us a few minutes late. Um, so the webinar schedule, kind of just like what Eli said, so um, I'm going to take a few minutes to kind of set the stage and talk about some lessons learned from Michigan. Um, Mark Abrahamson from uh, MDA will be talking about EAB in Minnesota, and then Colleen Matula uh, with the Wisconsin DNR will be talking about a few case studies that she's been a part of on managing for EAB. So to make sure our other speaker, speakers have plenty of time, I just want to kind of set the stage of what um, some of the lessons we kind of have learned from Michigan. So uh, EAB was first detected, first identified in Detroit, Michigan in 20, 2002. So that's crazy that it's been this long. Um, so it has killed millions of ash trees and spurred many uh, research projects and management uh, ideas. So one of the kind of management ideas, this management uh, program of integrating different, different tools is called SLAM, or show, Slow Ash Mortality. Um, and below you can see the citations um, that kind of summarize a lot of this information. But one of the goals of SLAM is to integrate different tools. Um, so whether that includes girdling of trees, the purple sticky traps that you may have seen um, that are coming around Minnesota and other states, uh, for detection, insecticides, harvesting, and biocontrols. Um, so the goal is to look at how we can integrate, the goal of that project is looking at how you can integrate different systems, different tools um, to work together. Um, and so from SLAM, they found that um, there's been a few different ways you can integrate tools instead of coupling, including coupling girdling trees um, and trees treated with insecticides. Uh, will likely produce a synergistic effect. And there's this idea that, there's this recent idea that you can couple this, um, including by girdling and also injecting with this insecticide to create these kind of lethal trap trees. So you kill them, you get them inside and kill them and then remove it. So um, there's some exciting opportunities here. Um, also, detection is hard. So um, 
EIB hung out in Michigan for a while before we fully understood the impact. Um, so detection is hard from this species. And from some studies in Michigan, um, in Midland County, um, they were working in an area where they thought EAB was at. Um, it was generally thought to be under low population levels. Um, there was no symptoms or signs or visual decline of green ash in this system. Um, but they thought it should be here. I bet it's here. We're just not seeing it yet. So they looked at if you can use girdling as an effective detection method. Um, so they tested out different amounts of girdling and found as few as two trees per acre is effective. So two trees were just as effective as um, larger kind of amounts. So seven versus two. So you can get away with two trees per acre of ash. And also clusters can be really effective um, as little as three clusters compared to 12 clusters. So clustering trees and using these as a way to detect lower population um, can be really impactful. Um, that's not to say EAB didn't attack or colonize the trees that weren't girdled. The trees that were girdled, girdled had an over 90% um, colonization and a higher rate of colonization than those that weren't. And finally, kind of bringing this home and setting the stage for Mark. Um, so black ash is super susceptible. Um, this is from some personal communication from Dr. McCollum at MSU, um, and she's been working a lot looking at um, both black ash and other ash species. So it's a highly preferred host in plantation studies. And this is, as she put it, this is the most highly preferred host um, given even compared to green, white, blue, Asian species, European species. Um, so it's super susceptible. And the larval galleries tend to extend further. And this could be for two reasons. Um, it could be due to anatomical features, so just the physiology of, of black ash, but it also could be the environmental factor. So black ash grows on these poor nutrient, uh, these poorly drained nutrient poor sites. So that could also contribute to that. So what does that mean? So fewer EAB larvae are needed to kill black ash than other species. Um, so with that kind of really positive message, I <laughs> want to turn it over uh, to Mark and allow him to give an update on EAB in, in Minnesota. Click on participants. participants. Oh. Uh, sorry, all the way to the left. Okay, Mark, you hey, should Mark, now be set to go. go. Okay. All right, so I see my slides. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of the uh, background and status of EAB in Minnesota. Um, so when I hit the down button, I get a different set of slides. Is there another way I should be advancing the slides? Mark, sorry about that. My uh, button wasn't working. Hit the little, there's a very small arrow above the center of your slides pointing to the right. Go ahead and use that. Ah, got it. Okay. So uh, thank you. EAB, of course, is originally, it's native to uh, Eastern Asia. So China, the Koreas, um, Eastern Russia. And interestingly, it's, it's really not a pest in that area. So it uh, behaves kind of like um, some of our native boo prestids that we have in Minnesota, bronze birch borer, bronze poplar borer, two-lined uh, chestnut borer, that uh, normally they're not a problem. It's from time to time, they can become a problem, but uh, for our native trees, not a big deal. Same thing for EAB in Asia. 
However, um, you bring um, EAB to uh, North America, and that's, uh, um, like I said, so, uh, sorry, the, the uh, biology in Asia, uh, you've got the adults around during the summer, uh, lay eggs on the trees, uh, larvae hatch and uh, burrow into the trees. In Asia, this is restricted to, to dead, dying, dying declining uh, native um, ash trees. And then, of course, um, if you have North American ash trees in Asia, which has had has happened, um, green ash planted in particular, they, they are just killed outright. So uh, emerald ash borer uh, brought to North America, most likely in some kind of uh, you know wooden uh, packing material, it was brought first to the Detroit, Michigan area. This was probably in the early 1990s. And so as we heard, um, it wasn't until 2002 it was discovered. It went quite a bit of time from the time that it was uh, originally introduced until it was um, recovered. And as I have alluded to, the biology in North America is, is essentially the same. The difference is that uh, the trees uh, that we have here in North America are not at all resistant to emerald ash borer. So uh, they're relatively quickly, um, once they become infested, they uh, become heavily infested and are killed. So the biology is, uh, the, the insects are doing the same thing uh, in Asia and North America, it's just the trees are, uh, are not resistant in North America the same way that they are in Asia. A few kind of um, small caveats to that. Uh, blue ash does appear to be more resistant than um, some of our other native species, such as uh, white, green, and black. Um, of course, in Minnesota, you don't find blue ash naturally. You might find it planted in some places, but it's not, uh, it's not really any kind of significant component in the forest. And uh, black ash, our, our most significant component in the forest, is very, very susceptible to EAB, as are both green and white also. So all of our native ash in Minnesota at uh, great risk from EAB. And uh, what happens is that, you know, the, the mortality can go pretty fast. And so it, it uh, wh what's happening is that the visible part of what you can see going on happens pretty quickly. And so kind of like, again, that analogy of uh, EAB in Michigan had been there for 10 years, maybe a little bit more before it was discovered. Um, you can have EAB in an area, uh, for instance, on this street in Ohio, and all those trees look just fine, but in the actuality, they're all uh, fairly heavily infested with emerald ash borer to the point that in this particular case, uh, this picture is, is used a number of times, um, with a few years later, that's what those trees look like. They're all uh, dead from emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer had been there for a while, un unknown, and uh, once, once the effects start to be seen, um, it can happen pretty quickly. And the hard part is, what do you do about that? And really, um, the, the fate of a tree infested with emerald ash borer, um, there's only w one of three things that can happen. Um, either these trees are going to get removed. That might be before they're dead. It might be after they're dead, but they can get removed. Um, insecticides work really well for emerald ash borer. So for trees that warrant that investment, um, insecticides, as far as anyone can tell, can uh, protect them indefinitely. So certainly there are options to, to preserve trees, again, that, that warrant that kind of investment. Uh, but if one of those two things doesn't happen, these trees are going to die and fall apart. So uh, there have been very, very, very few um, ash trees that have escaped EAB um, and infested areas that haven't been treated with insecticides. There's a few. Um, there certainly has been some work in Michigan to look at um, ash trees that, that survived the, the onslaught of EAB. But again, it's a very small percentage. Um, and uh, you know why they escaped, I think, is is still yet to be to be figured out. So for any ash on the landscape right now in Minnesota, we have to expect that it's going to be one of these three things um, that's happening with those trees eventually. Uh, where is EAB uh, in the country? Well, across most of the eastern part of the country, um, widespread, but not necessarily in high abundance through all those areas where it's widespread. There's a lot of um, places here throughout the eastern part of the country where EAB is present, but it's not yet at really high levels. Um, that core area in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, um, certainly through those areas, um, you know, huge impact on ash to date. Uh, and that area, you know, that core area keeps expanding uh, each year, as do the, the outer areas as well, to where we're out to now. We've got, uh, you know, a pocket of EAB in the Boulder, Colorado area. Uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Uh, I think this past year there were five new states that were added, and that's um, 
you know, probably a pattern that's going to continue um, as EAB continues to spread across the country. Um, within Minnesota, um, EAB is along the eastern edge of the state. So uh, Twin Cities is where it was found originally. And you can see that uh, through the Minneapolis St. Paul, uh, there's kind of a, a large core area there and then some uh, more outlying pockets um, through southeastern Minnesota, certainly that um, eastern Winona County, uh, as well as Houston and a bit of uh, Wabasha, uh, very widespread, significant impacts to where uh, forest mortality shows up on uh, aerial sketch maps now. We can see ash killed by EAB. Uh, and that, of course, it's, it's also going to, to continue into a large. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the spread rate, Minnesota has actually been had a, a bit of a slower spread from county to county than uh, the U.S. on a whole. And so this is a rate of infestation in new counties by year of infestation for the U.S. as an average, that's the blue line, and then Minnesota as the red line. So we've pretty well tracked as about a quarter to a third of the national average in terms of how fast EAB is spreading, but it is still spreading. And you can see that, I mean, there's only one direction that line's going to go as we go into the future. So certainly um, we have to continue to uh, expect to see Emerald Ash Borer expanding into to new places, even though the longer um, we can make it take to do that, the better off we're going to be. So really the best way to deal with Emerald Ash Borer is not to have it in the first place. So the longer we can keep it from getting to new parts of the state, the better off those parts of the state are going to be and uh, more opportunities to you know make their forests more resilient to Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and that comes to the, you know, how do we do that? And really the emerald ash borer is a difficult insect to regulate because it moves in articles that can be moved by anybody. Um, it's not like, um, you know, it can only be moved in something that's, that's uh, moved by uh, businesses or uh, professionals in some way. Firewood can be moved by anybody. And that's one of the, the chief ways that emerald ash borer is moved. So our best bet, and really it always has been, is on education and uh, making sure that people understand how this movement happens, how to keep it from moving. So that's been a big focus for us is to um, advertise uh, how to, you know, not to move firewood or to use firewood locally, um, use heat treated firewood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, going forward, that's only gonna become more important. Uh, when EAB was first found in Minnesota in St. Paul, um, regulations were probably pretty important because we had a, a limited population um, at that time, and uh, there, there were fewer people that had the ability to move it out uh, of the Twin Cities, primarily tree care services. So um, at that point in time, that quarantine was, was probably pretty important, um, probably did some good. Maybe it helped in, in reducing that spread rate uh, relative to, to other states. But as that infested area grows and gets bigger, um, that piece of the puzzle diminishes in importance, um, whereas the education component really um, still is very important. Um, so for the time being, you know, EAB is still a regulated species. Um, it's, it's against the rules to move uh, articles that can move emerald ash borer out of quarantine places. I'm going to go back just a couple slides to reference uh, the map. And so you can see those shaded pink areas that have the red lines around them. Those are areas regulated for emerald ash borers. That means that um, ash, any kind of ash wood, um, ash material, or hardwood firewood, so not just ash firewood, but any kind of hardwood firewood should not move out across any of those red lines um, unless it's under a compliance agreement with the Department of Agriculture, meaning the product's been treated in some way. One thing that's a little confusing on this map is that um, there are areas that are regulated in other states that don't show up on our particular map here. So for instance, um, all of the state of Iowa, as well as uh, pretty much the southern half of Wisconsin are all also regulated. And so that means that's one big contiguous area where products can legally be moved from Minnesota into the southern Wisconsin or into Iowa, and they wouldn't be uh, technically crossing in those quarantine borders. That's another reason where the education becomes important because we've got these increasingly large areas where um, the insect is regulated, and yet areas within those regulated um, locations that emerald ash borer is not yet uh, being seen. So for instance, um, in the uh, Duluth area, St. Louis County, you can see that southeastern corner of the county is regulated, but emerald ash borer has only been seen in Duluth so far. Um, you know, it behooves us to also not move um, infested material 
or potentially infested material around within that, that quarantined area to the extent that we can. Um, so we don't want to spread EAB even within those quarantine areas any more than, than really has to happen. Um, okay, and so I just wanted to finish up by just reiterating how important the education is. I think that um, one of the things that has had um, some benefit in the, the Twin Cities and urban areas of the state have been some best management practices for tree care businesses. And so, as I said, when EAB showed up in St. Paul, you know, a really important aspect was the potential movement of, of, of wood through tree care businesses. And this is one way that we tried to use education to help um, reduce that. This is all about just doing work on potentially infested ash trees during the winter and then having that material process before summer because the beetles are only emerging potentially during the summer. And so we want to limit the movement during that active time of the beetle that could result in beetles emerging in new places or in transit to new places, et cetera. So I think uh, as we go forward, we need to think about how can we um, maybe expand some of these ideas. This is an example um, sign that the city of St. Paul used to communicate that message. Don't uh, move around your ash debris until the winter. Um, so I think as we go forward, we need to think about how do we perhaps try to, to um, expand some of these ideas into more um, northern settings where we've got uh, more material going to mills or for other purposes and, and not that type of same tree care use. And uh, those are all the slides I've got for you today. You need me to do Great. anything, Eli? Thank you, Mark. Yep. Let's see if we've got any questions coming through. Uh, so if you have questions, please feel free to uh, put that into the chat room. Otherwise, we can see if there might be questions um, from some of the other locations. Any questions within Green Hall for Mark? So Mark, what do you think is cold? Northern Minnesota and cold weather. So the question is about how a winter will impact EAB in Northern Minnesota? Yes. Yeah, well, that's something that a lot of work has been done on, particularly in Minnesota. So Rob Bennett has been a, a, a big uh, part of getting that work done here. Um, and the work that, that Rob and myself and others have worked on have found, has shown that uh, EAB is, is killed at cold temperatures. They're, I mean, they're fairly hardy. It has to get fairly cold, but they, they're not impervious to the cold. Um, so an example would be, um, you know, we haven't had a very cold winter for a couple of years, but back in the winter of 2013, 2014, um, where we got down into, I think, 23, 24 below Fahrenheit in the Twin Cities, um, we measured in the field standing trees about 60 to 70 percent mortality of emerald ash borer larvae in trees. So that's that's larvae that just sat out uh, through the winter in trees like they normally would, and a, a big chunk of them got killed in that cold winter. Um, and that's very much in keeping with a lot of the other work we've done uh, both field experiments and lab experiments, but this was a, a great um, real life um, example of that playing out. Problem is that it's 60 to 70 percent of the population. And if you're not able to sustain that level of mortality every year, or maybe even a, a little bit heavier level of mortality every year, that population is still able to grow. And uh, it doesn't ultimately eliminate the problem of the beetle getting to a population size that will kill trees but it does potentially make it take longer. Um, so that also may be something we've benefited from in Minnesota in terms of, of slowing down that spread rate is the occasional cold winter um, knocking back the population. So some kind of simple modeling that Rob has done with that shows showed that um, if you get 60 to 70% mortality uh, every year or so, um, it is, it's probably gonna double or even perhaps take longer to get to the point of, of a, a population level that will kill trees. However, it still gets there. You need to get upwards of uh, 80 to 90 percent mortality on a consistent basis to perhaps, um, in theory, keep a population below um, the threshold that's going to be killing trees. And um, you know that that cold of a winter on a consistent basis. Um, I don't think we have emerald ash borer present anywhere um, in the country, on the continent, maybe in the world that we know of that we're able to to look at and and say, well, here's what happens in that situation. So really. It's pretty speculative for what will happen as EAB expands into northern Minnesota. I'm, I'm certain that EAB will be able to exist throughout northern Minnesota. I think it is uh, perhaps still a question for perhaps parts of northern Minnesota, 
Um, if, the, if the populations can be affected enough by winter to, to make a difference, I would say, um, you know, that's an optimistic thought, but uh, I also have to think, um, you know, pessimistically that it may not play out that way, so. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, it looks like we have another question about what are the um, mechanisms of resistance in Southeast Asian um, ash trees? Yeah, and so I'm not an expert on that work, but I can tell you from work that's been published by folks in Ohio and whatnot that if you were to just look at an Asian ash tree and compare it to a North American ash tree, which is what they did, um, chemically those trees are different. They've got a, a different chemical makeup um, and it just it, the our North American ash trees are are just at the beginning when a, a beetle first gets to a tree they're more palatable, um, and then from that point once a beetle gets into a tree and the tree reacts to it they've got th these induced defenses, and it appears that again um, to to try and relate the the research that other folks have done my understanding of it is that our North American ash trees have the same types of of potential defenses that Asian ash trees do but something is not, the, the signal is not getting realized by the tree that it's time to trigger all these defenses against the beetle, the same way that happens in those Asian ash species. So um, it may be that the, 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 you know, the premise is there, it's just, it's not getting activated, right? The tree's not recognizing the damage as it should or, or, or whatever, but um, those are probably the principal differences. Another difference from Asia beyond the trees is of course they have, uh, natural enemies that also prey upon emerald ash borer. There's a lot of work to identify what um, parasitic wasps are attacking emerald ash borer in Asia. Um, work done here in North America to make sure that they're not going to do anything bad in our country or on our continent. All that work was done. Uh, there really is no risk from these species and there has been uh, work all across the, the EAB infested parts of the country to get those uh, natural enemies out in the environment and get them reunited with emerald ash borer. Um, so that hopefully also will make an impact ultimately on the, the population dynamics of EAB. Uh, but that's still kind of an open question is, is it, will they have enough impact on EAB um, to, to really change how the population behaves? Um, and that's something we're also trying to, to figure out in Minnesota, but certainly we've done a lot of work to get the species out there. Great, Mark. And then one last question is, what's the penalty if you do move wood? Um, outside of a quarantine zone, and then how can is there a way for um, citizens or your neighbor to report you? Yep, yep, and we do get um, reports, and that is really you know the best way to kind of police that quarantine. Um, you know we've got a you know a person or two who works on this issue, and um, you know it's way too big of an area to be out on uh, checking on everybody. Uh, the penalty can be pretty substantial if it's um, a serious offense and a blatant offense. Um, in statute, the, the maximum penalty is $7,500 per day um, per violation. So it is a very substantial penalty uh, potentially. In any given circumstance that um, you know, there's a, a, a penalty matrix that uh, an incident would go through to determine what the, you know, a fair penalty would be. Um, we haven't had a, a lot of fines in Minnesota, but we have had some. Uh, most of them were in the earlier days of the quarantine where the, we had uh, we had some more resources to use to enforce the boundaries. And also um, with those smaller boundaries, it was more practical and probably more effective. Um, so we've had maybe um, you know 10 or so fines in the history of the quarantine and EAB, uh, but none recently. And if uh, you know, again, depending on the circumstances, if it's it's done uh, simply an error, uh, you know, then our biggest concern is just uh, fixing that error. Uh, we've had instances where we've gone and collected wood that was taken out of a quarantine area uh, by by uh, in ignorance, uh, just by a, a person off the street. We collected it, was infested with emerald ash borer. We did have EAB uh, emerge out of that wood uh, in the lab. So. Uh, some some real some very real examples of uh, EAB being mo being moved inadvertently by people and what I've learned from that is again how important education is and not educating folks once but repeating it every chance we get to um, just keep it on people's minds as this is an important issue that hasn't gone away and, and isn't going to go away. Yes, I agree. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for sharing kind of the status of EAB in Minnesota. Um, so. Uh, with that, we'll switch over to Colleen Matula. 
And Colleen is a forest ecologist and silviculturist with the Wisconsin DNR. And she's going to be presenting on some of the work that she's been involved with, with trials in black ash and management. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it over to Colleen. And Colleen, um, yeah. Hello, this is uh, Colleen, and I'd like to uh, transition into talking about um, management of black ash and how we, you know, what are we learning from our ash trials um, to basically improve the resiliency in uh, these black ash stands and to think about that. So I'm going to toggle through some slides here. Um, I have an overview, first talking about um, our civil culture trials directory, then going into uh, a slide that uh, depicts the EAB in Wisconsin, the black ash uh, cover type as well, um, looking at some of the black ash trials and how they're um, helping us develop guidelines by learning from the trial results and considerations for management. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So I first want to give you a background on our civil culture trials directory. In 2001, we developed uh, this trials directory. It uh, was conceived with the idea that, uh, you know, civil culture is worthy of tinkering and documenting. Um, the trials um, have been documented on a website, which is listed below, um, and the compilation of this great work is from field foresters across the state. We have uh, over 100 trials submitted um, into this directory on our website in a variety of cover types um, using a variety of methods. And they're meant to be, you know, um, a field trials. They're not research, they're not replicated, but they're meant to be more of like an adaptive process to developing alternative cell culture methods. So that's available on our website there below. So how has the silviculture trials helped develop black ash management recommendations now? Um, you know, we have a, the subset of black ash trials. Uh, we have about um, 30 of them in our directory that we've taken a look at. But first I'd like to show you a little bit about our uh, black ash resource in the state. And um, here's the, basically a slide depicting the quarantine counties in our state. Um, and as we find new occurrences of uh, EAB, up north, um, most likely our state will be entirely quarantined. Um, and so all the counties in white will turn to red with a few more occurrences that we find up north here. But uh, the map to the left here, that's in uh, blue, green, and red, um, it was developed by our forest health uh, staff. Um, originally, when we uh, first discovered EAB in our uh, in the state of Wisconsin, which was in 2008. And they developed this map to take a look at the potential risk to ash due to EAB. So uh, you can barely pro probably see the red, but there's red dots in the northern part um, of the county. And then it, uh, that depicts that's a high potential of risk. And those are the areas where we have a lot of black ash acreage. We have over um, you know, a million acres of black ash, in, especially in the northern part of the state. So, um, so there is a, a lot of risk to these areas, and we realize there's a lot of considerations that we have to um, think about as we're managing these areas. So as I mentioned, we have um, a subset of uh, swamp hardwood or black ash trials that we've looked at uh, over time. Um, originally, when the Civil Culture Trials Directory was developed, um, I put a call out to all field foresters in our state to send me um, their management trials in all cover types, but especially swamp hardwood, because uh, we you know, wanted to learn more about this system. Um, the, the cover types managing in black ash, it's not an easy cover type to manage because there's so many considerations to think about. So I received um, some from way back in 1974 all the way th through 2014. 
And we also recently um, did some follow up monitoring uh, and analyzed the data from these trials and summarized them in 2015. So a lot of what I'm presenting today is um, uh, from these trials, what we've learned from them. So here's a map of where a lot of our swamp hardwood trials are in the state. Um, you can see mostly uh, where our ash resources is, is in uh, the central part of the northern part of Wisconsin. But we have some other trials elsewhere throughout the state. So the swamp hardwood silviculture treatments that we've covered and taken a look at are those prescriptions um, uh, including shelterwood, clear-cut coppice, selection harvest, intermediate thinning, um, diameter limit, and supplemental planting. So you can see some of the pictures there below. Uh, the one to the far left is the strip harvest. Um, one in the middle is uh, the thinning, intermediate thinning, and the one to the right is the supplemental planting. And now I'd like to review in more depth these uh, basically three silviculture treatments. Um, one of them, which we've had the most success with, is uh, strip clear cut, or sometimes we call it strip shelter wood. Um, the reason why we call it strip shelter wood is the strip that's harvested uh, is less than 120 feet in width um, being harvested. So this one in the picture is uh, about 50 feet um, cut strip, and then we had 50 foot leaf strips adjacent to it. And the intention is to harvest the leaf strips over two to three entries once we find that there is um, regeneration established in the harvested strip. So as I mentioned, uh, these me this method provided the best balance between establishing regen and maintaining the hydrology at the site. Because most of you know that uh, hydrology is a consideration. There's a fear of swamping um, as a result of harvesting these sites. And also there is uh, hearing from the operators, uh, the contractors that harvest um, these sites. Operability is fairly easy. And then it also limits wind throw um, at these sites as well because black ash is such a shallow rooted species. So with strip clear cuts uh, and strip shelter woods, the st harvest strip can be 30 to 200 feet wide. Um, if you get uh, anywhere from 120 feet all the way up to 200 feet wide harvested strip, um, then we start calling them strip clear cuts because of their width. So here, uh, the picture to the right shows uh, two years later, this is uh, the same harvested strip as what you see on the left in comparison. So, and, and we've noted, um, I'll show you a slide later on here, um, some of the species that we've found um, that um, seeded in these strips. Um, a lot of the regeneration that we're seeing are, uh, you know, sprouts from the stump, so. The next uh, silviculture treatment that we've taken a look at is clear cut or coppice with reserves. Now we consider this a conditional method in black ash when you're harvesting or considering management in black ash because um, conditional because uh, the reserves should be present at the site. Um, the re reserves that we've seen um, is uh, all non ash species, of course, uh, cedar, hemlock, yellow birch and red maple is some of the species that we've been seeing. But uh, with this method, we've seen a greater risk of swamping and then also competition uh, from species like alder, uh, reed canary grass, uh, things like that. Even cattail can be a uh, competitive species at this site. But the successful uh, sites that have been managed through this method um, you know, they've had a lot of reserves left at the site after cutting and uh, species like cedar and yellow birch have seeded in the areas that have been cut. The third method that I'd like to go over is um, clear cut uh, with uh, artificial uh, regeneration conversion 
it's a supplemental planting. This uh, is over in Hayward uh, that we tried. This is on a small site, it's only about two acres, um, but it was previously a swamp hardwood black ash alder type. And uh, what's so special about this site is, um, you know, usually in black ash, you have uh, deep organic soils. But at this site, the mineral soil was close to the surface and uh, there was a thin organic layer. So um, at this site, we first harvested, we did a clear cut of all uh, tree species at the site. Um, we then fecund mowed all the competing shrubs like alder. And then we waited a couple months to do the glyphosate spray competition and then planted with several conifer and hardwood species uh, later in the fall. And the species that we've planted, the most successful species were tamarack, black spruce, and white pine. And um, I have to mention that we also put up fencing, deer fencing, to protect the, um, the whole area so um, deer wouldn't browse, especially on white pine. But those three species were the most successful of non-ash species at the site. And I think that one of the reasons why this site was successful and it didn't swamp out um, is because um, that it wasn't a deep organic layer. There was mineral close to the surface. So um, those are some of the considerations that I'll continue to mention throughout this presentation. So here's the abstract. Uh, usually with all trials, we have an abstract that's written up. And this is the abstract that uh, went along with the planting trial, the supplemental planting trial. And here's um, basically the abstract is, you know, mentioning the project is uh, to try to demonstrate viable methods um, to convert ash to um, other species uh, in the advent of emerald ash borer attack. And then it gives a little background on the site itself, a little bit about habitat types, soils, and site index. And then at the bottom, I, I did state here the total cost of um, treating that two acre site and then planting ended up being about $4,800. So that's a little bit about our trials, three trials that we've um, you know, presented here. Now I'm going to transition into taking those civil civil culture trials, and um, there are many people interested in these trials, including academia. So we collaborated with um, you know this Forest Sciences partnership with Dr. Tony D'Amato. He's a civil culture professor and researcher. He used to be at University of Minnesota, but now he's in Vermont. Um, but we did a we formed this partnership to take a look at all those lowland ash trials that we have in Wisconsin. And uh, the next step is to develop guidance for managing EAB impacted areas. So his students collected more data at, the, at these sites um, and they analyzed and summarized the ash trials. Um, and they evaluated especially the tree regeneration response after the silviculture method was implemented and across various cover types and silviculture treatments. So here are some of the results and summarization of what they've been finding. So, so believe it or not, black ash, we have about eight different habitat types in black ash. And that reflects um, basically its nutrient regime and moisture regime. So that's reason why we have uh, about eight uh, different habitat types across the state. So in our silviculture trials, they uh, analyzed about five different silviculture methods. And we happen to have about 18 trials in that one particular habitat type, um, the FNABARON type. Um, just because it was probably located in the middle part of the state where there was the same habitat type, but we did have some outlier um, habitat types analyzed as well. So those are some of the, um, the habitat types and the silviculture methods that were looked at. And the results showed 
that um, you know shelter wood and clear cutting were comparable across all the habitat types. They pretty much had the same results. And the um, lower intensity treatments, such as uh, intermediate thinnings and selection treatment, had lower regeneration densities. Um, and we found also that non-ash proportion of regeneration tend to be highest in intermediate thinnings and salvage, followed by shelter wood. So this is uh, um, an interesting fact um, to find, you know, if you want to manage for non-ash species in these areas, you might want to consider a shelter wood harvest. Also, uh, shrub densities were higher in the richer habitat types that we, we have in the state. And uh, some of the non-ash species included red maple, yellow birch, balsam fir, and basswood. Actually, some of the species that we found on that clear-cut coppice with reserve treatment that I mentioned before. Then uh, lastly, they found that on some of the trials, swamping occurred both on clear-cut and diameter limit treatments, more so than the other treatments. And the graph just de uh, below depicts, um, you know, the level of uh, ash regeneration versus non-ash regeneration in red at one of our habitat types. So now I'd like to toggle into, you know, so we have all these silviculture trials in black ash. What other tools are we developing right now in Wisconsin? Uh, as we learn more about um, these managing black ash types. So right now, currently, one of my colleagues, Greg Edge, is developing what's called a lowland ash stand assessment checklist. And this is in very important for foresters, field foresters, to take with them in the field and take a look at various attributes if they're considering management in black ash. So this uh, checklist covers, I'll toggle into the next slide, it, uh, it uh, basically is a checklist that looks at site quality, you know, looking at your habitat type and drainage and soils and vigor of the trees, your sale operability, which is really important for considering, you know, access into these sites. Um, is there enough volume to harvest in these areas? Um, also, uh, advanced regeneration. You know, what percentage of non-ash species do we have out there um, right now? Uh, acceptable growing stock, herbivory, hydrology risk, and interfering vegetation. So with this checklist, field foresters will take that into the field and check off you know, some of these attributes that are mentioned here. And um, getting a full stand assessment is really important in evaluating management of these stands. And as I mentioned before, um, managing these sites, probably the two important things to take a look at are soils, you know, your depth of organic soil, that peat over mineral, and how close mineral is to the surface, um, because that's going to tell you a little bit about in the swamping potential, but also uh, perhaps other species, non-ash species that you could plant there or try to regenerate at the site. Uh, habitat type is really important as well. Um, in Wisconsin, we recognize that our there's 11 different fraxinous types across the state. So not all ash stands are created equal. <laughs> There's some differences in their um, uh, plant components as a reflection of their nutrient and moisture regime. So we uh, have this partnership developed with Dr. John Kotar to publish the Wisconsin Wetland Forest Habitat Type Guide. It's uh, going to be online fairly soon. So um, this habitat guide divides up the northern part of the state into five regions and it describes um, the different habitat types in the wetland forest uh, components. So this not only includes black ash stands, but also um, tamarack and uh, swamp, other swamp conifer stands as well. So the lowland habitat type 
guide is a, a really important tool to understand the productivity and the level of competition at these sites. And to the left here, you'll see the, the diagram that COTAR uh, presents um, representing the different habitat types, both upland and gray, and then as you degrade into um, the lowland habitats in blue. So I'd like to also discuss a few um, things that we've learned from these civil culture trials under operational considerations, because this is really important if you decide to go into these areas and manage them. Um, operability um, to think about is log value. A lot of uh, black ash has a propensity to um, have ring, ring shake um, where the fibers are, are broken up um in the log itself but um you know a lot of these uh, things are taken into consideration when you're managing the site so um in wisconsin we have a strong pulp wood market and also by bio biomass market for uh, black ash so those are some options there but as far as veneer um that's fairly few and far between to see a veneer saw log um, uh, stand I usually see that more in Minnesota than I do Wisconsin. Uh, other things to think about are hydrologic risk. You know, these areas are, have potential for swamping, um, as seen in some of the silviculture methods. Rutting and compaction, um, these are very poor drainage areas, deep organics, impeded drainage. So considerations for road placement, if you're going to manage these stands, is very important. And this is not only within the stand that you're managing, but also adjacent to, because it's important to maintain that hydrology and think about adjacent areas um, surrounding the stand. Then harvest of frozen ground conditions is important, skidding over tops and debris. Um, is uh, prevents rutting, using high flotation equipment is uh, very important. And all these things we've learned from just observing uh, the silviculture trials as they're being managed and harvested. Uh, so a lot of considerations to think about. On, on a grander scale, when you're looking at a larger property and you're looking at how much ash you have across, um, you know, the county or uh, in your property that you're managing, you want to think about, well, what's the operability and access to these areas and the timing um, if you're going to manage black ash. You know, maybe the lower productivity sites might not be worth um, uh, managing when you're uh, taking a look at um, the larger picture. Then also recognizing distance to the nearest EAB occurrence. Uh, Wisconsin has uh, EAB um, guidance uh, for silviculture treatments uh, regarding emerald ash borer. And uh, in our guidance, uh, it recognizes that if you're near uh, uh, an occurrence within 15 miles, um, you should start thinking about uh, salvage treatments um, and or uh, trying to think of managing moving that stand into more of a non-ash uh, dominant state. So it's um, so a lot of things to think about when the EAB occurrence is coming closer to you. So other things, supplemental planting. Uh, you know, uh, considering species selection is very important for your local site, and then also considering deer repellent and fencing if you are going to plant in those areas. So the question is, can we increase resiliency in black ash forests to EAB? So what we've learned from these trials and uh, just observations within the state and talking to our partners um, in other agencies and other states, uh, we've looked at these trials and into potential strategies for prioritizing management and then development of guidelines uh, for EAB. Uh, you know, trying different silviculture treatments in black ash provides a balance between the diversity and the hydrology. You're looking at those particular uh, considerations. 
Uh, that stand assessment, that checklist that I mentioned is important for field foresters to consider and take out with them in the field. Um, looking at habitat type and soils can really help in determining, you know, what kind of strategy, what kind of management you're going to uh, pursue in these areas. And lastly, our future, we, we continue to uh, manage in black ash. Uh, field foresters, I, I have a few more black ash trials that I, I have been recently looking at. Um, in the future, near future, uh, Wisconsin is revising their EAB management guides. So a lot of these trials and what we've learned is going to be part of those recommendations. And we're always presenting and sharing uh, information with others. I know in particular that uh, habitat type guide that's coming out for low uh, wetland forests, we're going to be uh, developing training sessions for people across the, st the state to help them uh, use that, that as a tool. So and then lastly, I'd like to recognize that there is an ash conference coming up in Duluth on July 25th through the 27th. And We'll be presenting here uh, at that conference, um, as well as many other people sharing a lot about um, ash and ash management. So at that point, I'd like any questions. Thank you, Colleen. That was great. And we've got some questions coming in and uh, feel free to add some more questions to the chat box. Um, but before uh, we do that, I just want to thank Colleen and thank Mark as well for presenting and also mention that uh, Colleen and others from Wisconsin DNR will be working uh, to incorporate some of these uh, prescriptions and trials into the Great Lakes Silviculture Library, um, which is hosted through SFEC. Um, and additionally, if you listening have uh, additional trials or silviculture um, uh, examples that you would be interested in placing on the silviculture library please feel free there's a link there also there is about four or five trials already on the library looking at managing ash um, for that and then before one final kind of logistical thing um, is that for those of you watching online, um, you should see the continuing education credit requests um, when you exit the meeting. Um, so please, please feel free to fill those out. Um, and now to get to the question. So Colleen, this is a kind of long one. Um, so curious about how the EAB risk map was produced. Do you have species specific inventory land cover maps or was this a model? If so, did it include soils and hydro regime? Um, so that's the first question. There's two or three more that come along with that. And um, so I can let you have that part and then kind of come to the other ones. How does that sound, Colleen? Okay, that sounds good. Yes, I, I can answer um, part of that question. I'm not in the forest health staff, but I, I do know a little bit about that potential risk map um, was developed basically on um, the FIA forest cover type um, acreage um, that they used in the modeling. They didn't use soils or hydrology at all within the modeling. It was just something that we needed to establish when we first uh, learned about the 2008 occurrence and how should we move forward um, with our management. So, so yeah, the risk map was basically developed off of the FIA forest type data. Great, and then kind of follow up, how often is the map updated? Well, I think that's the only version that I've seen. So um, I'd have to ask the forest health staff on that, but um, I think that was the only version that was developed for this time and I, I imagine we're probably going to update that with uh, our new emerald ash borer guidelines that we're going to be revising fairly soon. Great and that kind of leads into the next two questions from this longer question. Uh, was there an accuracy assessment done on this map 
and, and does this map create any efficiencies or save money in any way in how it's utilized? Um, let's see, I, the, the first question, um, I don't think there was any um, accuracy developed other than using the accuracy of FIA data mm -hmm. um, with the presentation of acreage and um, of our, our ash across our state. But um, and the second part was? Um, I guess how, especially with it being linked to um, the management guidelines that are being developed, um, how do you see this kind of creating efficiencies or saving money for you guys in how it's in its future use? Well, I think it was first developed uh, to get the statewide assessment of, you know, you know, first of all, we got in 2008, we found out that there was our first occurrence that was noted. Um, it was first developed just to see, uh, see on a statewide basis, what are the risks and how much ash do we have out there that could be p at potential risk? So um, I think it could be updated, but I'm, I'm not certain because most of our state we're finding um, new occurrences each year. So um, that's something I would have to ask our forest health staff. Great. Uh, let's see, a few more questions are coming in. One of them is, what's the cost of treating a mature stand with insecticide? You know, that wasn't part of our civil culture trials at all. Um, and I'm uh, not part of the forest health staff, so, um, but I know there are numbers out there on treating an entire stand with uh, the insecticide, but just that wasn't part of the trials at all. Okay. Uh, let's see some additional follow-up questions um, or some additional questions, Colleen. Any research related to thinning ash stands to 60 square feet of basal area and how that impacts stand resiliency, resilience and resilience to EAB? Okay, that's a good question in regards to silviculture. Um, we, we've have a couple trials where we've done uh, thinnings in ash uh, down to about 80 square feet um, of basal area with gaps, um, gaps put in throughout the stand, like one 60 foot gap per acre in addition to the thinning. And what we found on those sites is we continue to get more ash species regenerating within the gaps and then throughout the thinning areas um, we're less likely to get non-ash species in those areas, and that's basically what we found from the few. We only have a couple trials um, in that regard, so. Great. Thank you, Colleen. And then another one. Um, do you expect that ash-dominant unmanaged stands could be lost to ash regen due to EAB and swamping? What they've been finding in Michigan and then even parts, uh, the southeastern part of our state, um, we are losing these stands to invasive species. So um, the, the emerald ash borer infected um, areas um, where there is complete mortality. Um, there usually is a flush of um, ash regen from the seed bank, but uh, the seed bank itself is exhausted after that flush of regen from um, the ash seed bank. And so what's left is um, these other competitive species such as buckthorn, um, reed canary grass, and other invasives. So that's what they've been seeing in other areas. And I suspect um, we'll be seeing that as well um, if, if we're not going to do some active measures, I guess, in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions within Green Hall? No. Any final questions for Colleen online? Oh, here we go. Um, in, one more question, Colleen just came in. Uh, in Minnesota, suggested replacement species for planting is Manchurian ash, a non-native. Any opinions? 
<laughs> oh, I knew I'd get a question like that out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we've batted that around quite a bit um, within our own uh, silviculture group here. And, um, you know, about planting Manchurian ash in some of these areas. Um, I'm not a proponent of, uh, you know, uh, testing a Manchurian ash out, but because I have seen success with our native species, and that's that's my main reason for that, is because I've seen success with not only our uh, lowland conifer species at these sites within these trials that we've looked at, but also in some of the hardwood species um, as well. So. So a Manchurian ash is lower on my list of considerations. <laughs> Great. Well, that looks like all the questions we have. Thank you um, for joining us. And um, you should, as you log out, you should be able to fill in um, those credits. Um, again, Colleen's email is up there. Mark's email was up there. I believe my email was up there as well if you have any additional questions. And as always, we're always looking for potential case studies in the Great Lakes Silviculture Library. So feel free to log on and add what you're doing um, out there. Uh, thank you. And